<clears throat> one of the one of the first things I noticed was that photography started to take kind of a dip, like more like posed photography for um, whatever, whether they be ads or magazines. Yeah, because people um, were meeting a person. Yeah, and so like the illustrator started to become a little bit more like I don't have any data on this, but I can only imagine that illustration gigs have gone up like uh like have risen since the pandemic started because it is one of those remote things that you can do by yourself without a team in most cases yeah yeah um, no i i know it's that same boom i'm like you can see yeah. it like like i'm very present on twitter you can see like a lot of artists artists in that community like talk about the work they receive like a mm -hmm. bunch of students just out of school because of like that whole situation like the turnaround for them getting a job happened so much sooner because they yeah. don't have to pick up and leave, you know, and go cross state. Yeah, and that's, I'm finding that that, like anecdotally, that that seems to be the case where I'm at right now. Lots of the seniors, they just plan to stick around, which is really crazy to me because that never really used to be the, the like common, thing. <laughs> you know, like folks usually had the plan to like go somewhere like New York or California or whatever it may be, or Atlanta. There is a, I guess there's a tangential thought I want to come up, like kind of go across and it's called, uh, I'm calling it a methodical approach, you know, something I guess I value a lot when I, in art and I don't see it done very often, at least not to like a very late stage in professional art. You know, I guess I feel like I want to try to introduce this concept, you know, earlier on as early as possible. And maybe it can be like the catalyst for some new ideas for how you guys approach your own work. So cool. But to get into it, um, my name is Justin Benford, um, illustrator from Atlanta, Georgia. Graduated from SCAD, Atlanta, Georgia, and I am still in Atlanta, Georgia. So I'm chilling. Um, start with some work. So this is some personal work of mine. Um, I'm just gonna focus more of, I guess, the more illustrative editorial stuff I have going on. But this is some recent portraits I did. Guy on the light, right is Joji. I don't know if any of you guys listen to him. If not, you should. Uh, left side is just a fun piece, kind of works from like a reference. And I just wanted to kind of play around with line work and like lighting at the same time. That's cool. Um, mob cycle fan art on the left, any Yasha fan art on the right, you know, and just some other series of drawings as well. Um, but yeah, in terms of my, of me as an artist, I kind of bounce around everywhere. You know, that's kind of my thing. You know, I'm still trying to figure out like my own personal niche, but not really as a career, but like my own personal taste, which is kind of like a personal journey I'm going right now. I'm going through right now, but yeah. So let's get into it. Today, we're gonna to kind of talk about color uh, rendering and kind of how to achieve like believable lighting situations, even with really complex forms or really simplified forms. So hopefully turning from this line sketch here to something more believable and dynamic on the left. All right, am I going too fast? I'm making sense? Not at all, keep going. All right, cool. Or, or really quick, Justin, I feel like typically mm -hmm. When we've done this in the past, you've been open to folks interjecting. Do you want them to interject or do you want them to wait till the end? No, they, they can ask questions whatever they want. You know, yeah. I'm all about so, it. I guess, I don't know if you would be able to hear them from where they are. So if you mm -hmm. want to feed your questions to me, you can do that or you can come up and ask so that it's like in this, I don't know where, I don't know what the speaker is. That's I guess maybe it's the <laughs> next speaker that's registering my voice. So you can feed the questions to me or you can come up and ask yourself. Go ahead. Yeah, cool, cool. All right, so I want to go over a quick thing, a quick concept. You guys see my mouse on my screen? You do, right? Cool. So this is something that really, this is kind of what I think about when I think about color and rendering. Like I've, and this is that methodical approach I was talking about. I'm trying to like break it down in a way where it's like you at least have a consistent like anchor point or base for how you understand that intuitive process when you create art. So color. So I kind of break it up into two sections, temperature and saturation. And you have like this entire, like I have this little hue bar from like red, pink, green, blues on both sides. And for temperature, it's actually really interesting. Um, fun rule of thumb, if you guys get into it, if you haven't already gotten into it, I consider yellow, yellow to be the warmest color. Like you may look at red, you may think it'd be something warmer, like, you know, fire, hot lava. But yellow, I think is, it is the warmest color. And then going from yellow to any direction is when you have a shift in temperature for things to become cooler. Does that make any sense? That seemed very straightforward. I'll try to make it very simple. <laughs> but yeah, so 
And that's also, you can see, also see the same thing in the color well. You know, color well, that's why it's so kind of perfect. Cause it started from yellow, you go from warmest to cooler in any direction you go until it makes a perfect loop. So yeah. And then for saturation, um, applying for any color, and this is all thinking like RGB, digital work, you know. You can apply the same thing, of course, like traditional work as well. You can get into things like tint, shades, lights and stuff. But this is mainly digital. Um, for saturation, I like to perceive it as it's like you have whatever hue you may choose. And saturation, of course, is like going from the most intense hue to lack of color. So if you were to scrub it on like the color wheel on Photoshop, it would go from blue to white or blue to gray. And the only reason why it would change from white to gray is would be like intensity. Um, if it was more traditional, that would just be like shades or tints. Everybody following me? Yes, sir. All right, All right cool, cool. But yeah, so something like this, I think it's actually really cool if, because you know, everybody's different. We all have an entirely different approach to art. We have very different goals when we're drawing, when we're creating, you know, but I think it's very valuable because I see so many people rely strictly on in intuition when they're drawing, which is perfect, you know, which is the point. You know, that's what art is all about. But I think there's really, uh, really like a gem there when it, you can like kind of be able to kind of understand your own process and make simple like key sheets or like keys and legends you know how you understand that that makes sense yeah so yeah all right so let's get into it um so basically the way i'm going to kind of go through this coloring method is you know i'm mainly probably i primarily focus on line work and so the colors i use are kind of done to either accentuate or kind of fall behind that but I'm gonna use in color mode. I don't know if you guys have gone over that yet, but like, it's gonna be really simple. Literally, I'm gonna be using multiply and overlay. I don't know if you can see on my screen here, but on the, if you go to like the, however your Photoshop set up, it's typically right underneath the color wheel or color box. Um, they have render modes right beneath it above your layers. And if you select that, it usually says normal, but you have like a list of options that pop down all right here. Um, whenever I do like shadows, for example, I use Multiply. Multiply is a, it's a great fun layer because uh, it kind of acts like this, this like ambient, just dark layer, you know. It doesn't really fully mask all the colors beneath it, but it kind of works with it as well. Um, but yeah, so that's what this little ball is for. So we got this little teal ball, it's very neutral color, and I apply a shadow. Oh, something very important I want to talk about. A key thing, this is the best trick in the book for anything like light shadow related. Um, there's a dichotomy with how light sources kind of work when you apply it. So if you have a warm shadow, for example, you will nine times out of 10, unless there's like some weird relative situation, have a cool lighting system. If you have a cool shadow, you will have a warm lighting system. So like that, that temperature thing. So like if I were to apply like a very, I don't know, intense, warm, lime green shadow, you know, the cooling situation, like a cool light source, it would be more compatible if I kind of go up here towards these violets and blue and then vice versa. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So shadow here is like that shows warm. It's kind of like a more saturated kind of dark army green shadow. So the initial teal is like around here and the shadow is closer towards the yellow. All right. And then I kind of made two little lighting situations here where one could be like I kind of overpower that warm shadow by making even warmer light source just slightly at the top going back up towards that yellow and teal or i can just kind of overpower it completely and push it all the way down to the yellow that makes sense yep yeah all right cool. or at least it does to me <laughs> if anybody <laughs> want to know any questions at all you know, yeah, it, you know it's all it. nuanced <laughs> yeah no that makes yeah. sense you're explaining it really well all right cool well yeah and so between those two differences you can really you have really a lot of freedom because even though this is like a cool highlight warm shadow and then a warmer highlight like even though this was initially a warm shadow you can kind of overpower that and it kind of changes the effect and then with some tweaking you can you can have like this little nice rendered ball very simple very straightforward i think it's something really worth worth trying you don't even have to do it with the render modes you could do it yourself as long as you kind of keep those two things in mind you know so if you had like a red ball, a red like a uh, magenta ball. The shadow itself could be more violet for a cooler base. And the highlight can be something more orange, yellow, pushing towards that warmer hue. 
you you'll the effect becomes believable you know as long as you have that dichotomy between those two sort those two light sources and effects you know so cool i'm gonna zip through this real quick we're gonna do a real demo i promise <laughs> Um, so here's an example where I kind of apply that same effect, you know, so we have line drawing, we have flat colors, and I apply some like relative temperature stuff, but that's like mainly about skin, material, different topic. Um, and we kind of jump into it. So if I'm doing like flat shell sh cell shading um, colors, I can still create that believable lighting situation by keeping the, the, the shadow, which I started with multiply, I keep the shadows warm. You know, I apply shadows like core, ambient, occlusion shadows everywhere I need to, behind the hair, behind the face, things like that. And already it's, it's relatively believable. It's a fine, solid, cell shaded flat drawing. Um, next step is like I add a little bit of uh, highlight. Still very faint, not the best example now I'm seeing it on my computer. <laughs> but in the difference here, it's like I made the emphasis the, the strongest source of light in the overlay layer. I kind of pushed it here and I kind of use like a gradient tool, hold it down and it kind of like dissipates as it goes down. You know, so you have like this stronger highlight here in the face compared to this side. That makes sense. And you can you see like this cool lighting in this like warm shadow play off here. You can even see how like in this area here, this shadow is a lot warmer than this, this part of my face, you know, because it's like a less harsher area of light, you know, but yeah. So final product and What's really cool is like, even on kind of running through this, it's like, if this can act as a catalyst for like inspiration, like even just the idea that you can like tweak and make rules out of what can seem so complicated, you can achieve a wide range of like uh, fidelity. So even though I may have this flat drawing here, it's like using the exact same method, only overlay and uh, multiply, I've been able to achieve like high end rendered pieces like this. So same as before on his face, it's just a range of temperature values. Maybe you guys have seen it before, how like bottom side of the face is cooler, warm to cool again. And then all of the highlights here, same with her, it's all just overlay. And then all of the shadows are all multiplied. I only use two colors and, or two hues. And like, of course I'll change depending on like the, the saturation intensity but the actual hue bar itself does not change, you know? And it's cause it's like, at least I was able to kind of break it down to like those two simple rules and, you know, kind of having it play with the temperatures, temperatures I laid out with the local color. So yeah, there it's, you can achieve a wide range of complexity, you know, if you kind of through simplifying key aspects of art, that makes sense. <laughs> But what you're saying, I think, is really important. You know, like I know you mentioned that it's good to have that kind of intuitive mindset, but to be able to break down your process, like as it relates to illustration and not so much like fine art, it's yeah, good to it's have so that. Important. Yeah, it's good to have that predictability. You know, like I often like use the, the I don't know if it's, I make the comparison between illustration and like cooking, like having a recipe, like knowing the ingredients that go into that recipe instead of, instead of just sort of like guessing what a pinch of salt looks like, you're talking about like, know whether or not you're using a quarter teaspoon or a teaspoon of salt, you know? Like exactly. if you know those things, <clears throat> I think it could become less stressful for you. And I think that's definitely something that's it's an ongoing theme in what we talk about. Yeah, and that's what's so cool about it. Cause like, even like you said, with like cooking, it's like, you know, the more often you use different recipes and you cook different things, then over time, intuitively, it kind of feeds back into itself you'll be able to pick up on different flavor profiles. You'll be able to instinctively, just through muscle control, get that perfect pinch of salt without having to make sure is it a tablespoon, is it a teaspoon, you know? Exactly. So like that same thing can feed back into art. You know, if you can develop like a method, like a method for yourself, it'll slowly become second nature. You know, and so I think like having that reverberation, that back and forth of like, you know, all right, I'm doing it because it's fun, it's lit, you know, but you get stuck. I see so many people get stuck all the time and sometimes they lose progress because they weren't really paying attention to what their own what they were doing within their own work you know mm -hmm. yeah but yeah all right so demo time so i prepared this little <clears throat> flat drawing of this guy you know he's chilling hands in pockets and uh we're gonna be doing it from scratch because i think that's much more fun you know <laughs> and but it, i we're gonna keep it real simple and i'm gonna 
try to walk through and talk through each decision I'm making. You know, if you guys have any questions, you want to stop me, you totally can. You know, I'm just drawing. All right. But if you can see here on my left, it's maybe a little low resolution, but I have all my color layers separated, line and stuff. And I have two layers signified as light and shadow. I think shadow's the easiest to start off with. I think everybody kind of has that like, that, uh, that incentive to start with shadows. You know, it's the most evident, the most obvious shapes you can kind of put down. And then for this guy, I'm thinking I'll make the light source like come from over here, you know? Ching, ching, ching. So let's do that. All right, so let's go for warm shadows. So warm shadows, if I'm thinking strictly hue, um, like I said, yellow is what I consider the warmest hue out of the entire family. So whenever I'm thinking warm, it's in the, so that's what makes it so easy since I'm on a bar, it's typically the lower half, you know? And everything's relative, so of course warm colors exist up here, but from the jump, lower half is where you want to start. And if I'm doing warm, I'm just guessing and picking, you know, orange is a safe bet, you know, for most any lighting situation when it comes to like, at least how I'm talking about. So I can just throw down some shapes. Um, it's a little dark, lighten it up. You still use the square brush? I go back and forth. Now I actually use the round brush and oh. I have this dope, this super dope uh, texture brush from Chin Yu Kim. Uh, okay, his, cool. brush, his brush collection is awesome. But yeah, so I have like a little nice orange, a little saturated, not too strong, not too light. And when I first start off with stuff, I like to kind of keep it opaque, you know, nowadays, so I don't kind of, I don't lose what I'm going for, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah, it's like almost, I don't get, I, I get lost in the sauce. <laughs> yeah, it's almost kind of like doing a no tan drawing where you want to see the 100% darks against- Yeah, the 100% lights, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to do it like that. And like, and like I'm seeing here, it's a little dark. I'm, I may I keep going to see how it turns out. You know, but like, I'm just doing some very basic like shadow. And this is, this yeah. layer style is multiply, so that way it's not affecting the artwork, right? Yeah, so like it's, not only is it like directly on top, so it's not affecting the actual work beneath it. It's also this cool little trick, I don't know if you guys know about it. Like if you have like, for example, I have a bottom base layer that operates all my colors. <clears throat> like it's just like this gray formatted shape. And if you have a layer on top of it, while that layer is selected, and you hold alt and you press like that little space in between, I don't know if you can see it, it like attaches the layers to that. So all of my colors are attached to this bottom layer. But if I were to disable it, then it goes to being this. That makes sense? That's a whole other different topic, but it's cool. <laughs> all right, but yeah. So I apply some, like I was doing before, base, just color, you know? Whatever makes the most sense, you know, we'll clean up a little bit as we need to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit behind the head here. You know, and then it's it's okay if it's a little messy because when you zoom out, you kind of start to see the effect, you know. And that's already just like that's why I think like the the layer modes are so powerful because like they operate through light, you know, it's digital. It's all going to kind of carry some kind of effect, you know, even in this like basic cell shaded mode. All right, so this is kind of a this is kind of a good place for shadows here. A little bit there on the net. Cool. So now we kind of got that here. Um, what we can do now is we can jump straight to overlay the lighting situation. And what's cool is, you know, I chose a black guy, so his skin type is going to be definitely a lot more reflective. So that's going to lead more opportunity to showing this effect. But since it's already on sale and overlay, and I start off with a warm shadow, like a warm hue. 
Now I'm going to be moving away from this region, you know, cool lighting, warm shadow, uh, warm lighting, cool shadow, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going back up here. Maybe I can, I don't know, orange and blue, complimentary, makes it easy. Make, maybe make it a little bit more, a bit of a warmer blue, more violet. And let's see what that looks like. Ooh, see, sometimes, <laughs> like this is this is gray. <laughs> this is not what we want. It, and that's interesting to me too, because it's like it's still all color theory is relative, you know. So like you see on the skin, that's gray. You see on this jacket, very different effect, you know. Uh, let's adjust that. So uh, and like if I need a color to get lighter, I literally just make it lighter. That's that intensity thing I was talking about. Top is uh, most intensity, bottom's lower. You know that affects saturation, temperature, all the same. I like how you keep yourself from going crazy um, in terms of just like your method for like poking around the color wheel, you know? Uh, yeah. I know, I know artists who they have like the code, I guess, like the code of the color memorized for specific mm -hmm. things, you know? And I just- Oh I, yeah, people like that are interesting. <laughs> yeah, like I just feel like I'd lose my mind you know, thinking about different color codes, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and they just like plug them in and they don't have to think or, and I think that there's something really like romantic and also like uh, freeing to just sort of poke around the color wheel with this general knowledge that you've introduced, you know, it's not yeah. like you're poking around randomly, like you have the knowledge of what's warm and what's cool and on what spectrum of the wheel you belong. Um, mm -hmm. but I love this sort of touch and go thing. Like it's very, like, <clears throat> doesn't have to be so pragmatic, you know, like how you pick yeah. it. Um, but there is a loose formula that Justin's already like explained that he's going by. So it's not like it's completely random, you know? Yeah. You know, and that's what I think is so cool about it. Cause you know, you can, and this is something I've been working on personally. I've been, I try not to get too lost in the sauce. You know, it's like, I'm talking about like this methodical thing, but it's like, they got to a point where it got very stressful, you know, getting caught up in all those details. Yeah. You know? and, I mean, it's like, yeah, I have friends like and it's that. It's like, art's supposed to be fun, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I have friends like that where like they look at, you know, like a perspective or like some sort of drapery or a fold in my piece and, they they correct it as if though it was a math problem I got wrong, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's like it's, it's yeah. okay, it's chill. <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, yeah, that, thanks for the feedback, you know. Um, but I think it, it's it, it's healthy to not have just that one perspective, you know, where yeah, you're only gonna judge, you know, only look at a piece of art and then it doesn't mean anything to you because the U fold is not incorporated properly, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of like uh, a lot of overlap between fine art and illustration. I think the commercial aspect being leaning more towards illustration, mm -hmm. uh, the relatableness, if that's even a word, uh, of illustration separates it from fine art in a lot of ways. Where the fine art is more, you know, tends to be very, you know, you can confuse somebody, and it's okay to confuse somebody in the fine art world yeah <laughs> imagery um but i think those there's those parallels between the fine art world as it exists in practice and illustration as it exists as it exists in practice like as the business of it but then mm -hmm. there's that that similar connection that happens between illustration and the fine art world where it's okay to be wrong you know like that's one of yeah. those uh, and i tell my students that it's like you know it's okay to be wrong it just has to work you don't have to make your perspective you're not trying to pass Perfect. Drunk, you know <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, it's like you're not trying to replicate life. We see real life every single day. You know, there's like, and there's value in that, of course. You know, you could be a naturalist artist, you could be any kind of artist, but at the end of the day, we're talking about you, you know? So everything I'm starting off with, it's like, it's like, it is a hard color. I'm sorry, it's kind of messy. It's not my, it's not my best work, <laughs> but it's all a harsh, like, color. And literally, I just kind of go in with like, I, uh, sorry, I blanked out. Default brush, default eraser with opacity. And I kind of scrub away at the lines. You know, and that's actually something I can go into because that is how I primarily render things. Let me do something real quick for you. Yeah, so it's like applying the hard color 
and then taking an eraser with like a lower opacity and then sort of blending it into the base tone of the of the character. He's gonna get so if I, yeah, so like that little thing I was talking about with the ball, um, the actual physical take of rendering, this is like my go-to method. Like when I really get into it, it works for me every time, no matter the fidelity. So like I have this little ball, so let's make the shadow a little more saturated and a little warmer. You know, I can have a really dark ball. I can start off with a flat color. You know, you'll probably recognize how I did this in the past, Rodriguez. Yeah. And you can literally, this is how I've always done it. It's always worked for me. You can just kind of shape, oh, my bad. Wrong layer. Okay. You can just kind of shave away at it with an eraser. Opacity on. I just have opacity and pressure on at the same time using a little control. And I just kind of shave away at it, you know? And so like these two areas here. So now here, you know, I'm now I'm shading, but a little more gently. That way I kind of have that blend. And this is all just with the eraser. And maybe I'll go in with like the, uh, I pick uh, tool with the brush and I'll build it back up with opacity. But for the most part, that's all I'm doing, you know? And it's like, and everybody paints very different, obviously, right? There are some people who just paint strictly opaque. Painters like that are wild. Like Jasmine, for example, remember Jasmine? Or even Candace, Candace Posado, they paint opaquely. They paint like, they have this color here and they just choose this color, you know, off the grid and they just paint it, you know? I, I, I can't really do that. That's not my thing. So I've kind of found my in-between method, you yeah. know, and it's kind of carried by my understanding of light and color. But you kind of see this effect I was talking about here, like this rendering. That's literally me going back and forth between the uh, brush and the eraser, you know? And that's, and I, can, and I kind of render through layers. I don't do it all in the same layer. That kind of gives me that ability. And, you know, I kind of, so like, if I wanted to apply a core shadow, I like a little that. darker and more saturated. A little stronger if I'm... Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's cool, man. I'm telling y'all, like, like my last thing I'm gonna speak on is like I'm emphasize that point of like figuring out your method, like, and like it'll always change. Don't ever think there's like one way to do anything. It will never be just one way because it'll always change. Your interests will change. But for whatever current ideas you have in the moment, embrace those ideas and come up with something that works that's like tangible, you know, until it becomes second nature and you'll be able to do things, you know. And like right now, I just apply like a little core shadow, you know. I'm just literally going back and forth. You know, luckily a ball is very simple, you know, but this, this method applies to everything, you know. And that's what I was kind of doing here. You can kind of see like a more messy version here. You know, I just kind of shave away some of the colors, you know. That's why some areas are more opaque than others. You know, like if I were to fully render this out, I would kind of have that full fledged effect. Yeah. And then top it off, a light source. I made a warm shadow. We're gonna do a cooler light source. Right at the top. Right, right at the top, a little saturated. And I'm just literally blending it out. And at this, at this phase, since I'm not really erasing anymore, I'm just like color picking, you know? That's what I see. It kind yeah. of allows me. Like the key is, the reason why it becomes believable is the understanding, that thing I was talking about in my PowerPoint, the color relationships, you know? Because if I didn't have the understanding of color relationships, unless it was monochromatic, this could easily look all over the place, you know? I could even probably show you what happens if I didn't have the understanding. If it was looking like this, Oh, it kind of works still. <laughs> but like if it was like grossly saturated and the colors are weird like that, you know, it doesn't matter what my technique is because I don't have that secondary base understanding, you know. And it's like, and and uh, what's the word? For my lack of ability of like rendering at a fidelity like Candace, it's made up with that understanding of like relationships between lights and colors. And that's like kind of thing I was talking about. Like if you can kind of create like a, a key, a system for whatever your goal is, they can even be compositional goals. It doesn't even have to be like technical stuff like this. 
you, know, you can have a lot of success in how you convey your ideas and your work. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah, we're in this ball. Boom, bam. I hope everything's been kind of informative, you know? All right, following where we left off here, um, I just want to talk about like something else I've seen, at least of all my peers, you know, at, at SCAD, you know, a lot of things that hold people back is that people don't really do studies, you know, quick little studies, hour long studies, things that work with your goal. And that's that, and that kind of is like the foundation of coming up with a method, you know, like it took me forever to figure out, like, this is literally me like reading books constant experimentation of other smaller pieces emphasis on smaller pieces for me to be able to come up with this method that's so weird and strange until i explain it to people you know <clears throat> and it just comes from like taking time to just draw sometimes not for the sake of creation but just for the sake of practice if you grow you know it's a muscle it's a literally a neural connection you know and a lot of times you may have all the motivation and ideas in the world to like go for something but what kind of lacks is the, I don't know, like that intuitive nitty gritty that comes from like that more chill mileage, you know? I don't think mileage goes very, very, very far for creativity, but I think it does go pretty far for like nuance, technical understanding, you know? Like, you know, like perspective, for example, you know, perspective is taught in such a methodical way, rulers and grids, or whatever. And that's really cute, that's cool. But I really think personally, I think you can have a much stronger intuitive understanding and perspective combined with that if you just draw your room and it'll take you months don't get me wrong if you just draw your room with no grids just keep doing it till it looks right and it will intuitively be ingrained you'll you'll start to sense what a believable sense of perspective looks like and that goes for color anything you know so yeah i just yeah, want to make that little that last point i think the studies yeah <laughs> It's important. I think you already kind of touched on this, but I want to emphasize it is that when you sit down to do a drawing, like have like a conversation with yourself in your mind. Like I used to just kind of pass on the music and draw sort of aimlessly, hoping that I would gain understanding of specific elements, whether they be perspective, composition, proportion. Um, but I was waiting for it to find me instead of me trying to find it. Um, yeah. So it, it really, it really can help. Um, and I feel like Justin's already kind of alluded to this, to have a goal, you know, in a drawing, like maybe the proportion is wrong on something, but maybe that wasn't your goal. And so that's okay. You know, like if you sit down with the intention of perspective, like maybe your value isn't great, or maybe your, your cross contours don't work, but maybe that's not important in that one session because that's not what you're exactly. at. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So having, having a intention when you sit down to draw, um, so I just yeah. wanted to kind of emphasize that point a little bit because I feel like you touched on that and I think it's super important because it's really easy to sit down and want to make a really good drawing and that be your goal. But if that's mm -hmm. only your goal, it's a vague goal. It's not a very like specific goal, you know? Yeah. And you don't want to like get caught up and like, because like this happens all the time, like, you know, for some people can work where like they improve through their pieces, you know, but a lot of times that's not always the case, you know, like I'm not the type of person where like, I can rely on like a 25 hour piece to make me grow the way I want to, you know, compared to my overall goal, you know? You know, so it's like taking the time, just do stuff intentionally. Like I said, like the water sketchbook is a very good example, you know? Yeah. It's like, she, like if you have a, and it's like, it, it, it's different across the board because everybody's different. Like for me, since I want to do character design, high fidelity stuff, it's important for me to learn perspective and forms. But even as an abstract artist, you can apply that the same methodical approach by doing compositional exercises. If you look up compositional uh, like art exercises, you'd be amazed like how many things pop up for that that like can be done quickly with long or short sessions. You know, it's like it's everywhere. You know, we're we're problem solvers, uh, problem solvers looking for creative solutions. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like real. I really want people to embrace that. You don't have to wing it all the time. You know intuitive approaches are nice but like it, there's real power in like thinking about it you know and so yeah i definitely go back and forth it's all kind of leads into itself because like that is ultimately the effect i want in my digital work is i want it to kind of be like a nice perfect combination of my traditional as well i want that same grittiness which is why i kind of use these texture brushes all the time so yeah go back and forth it's fun y'all yeah you've, you've done a good job 
a really effective job rather at like transitioning and keeping that voice that 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 basic voice that you had so i saw mm -hmm. i saw you pursue quite a bit of traditional or analog as goni would say um mm -hmm. and, and it, it translates over very well it's a very interesting timeless question especially you know when i think about like my journey right now it's like a it's always going to be here's the sad truth there's always going to be a back and forth like there's always going to be a push and pull in that comfort i think that's like the, the thing about life embracing that change because you know i think style i think it's a combination of like inherited like nurture you know it's like we all perceive the world differently but our different experiences influence how we who we are at the same time you know so like the ways that have helped me is like i find other professional artists for example and i have very high taste i always look to the highest it, maybe it's probably it's gotten unhealthy sometimes but i look at artists who fall in that realm like you said people who are similar to my goals or style but it's important at the same time not to kind of get caught up in comparison as people say all, all the time because it gets dangerous too you know because you know you even if you understand the mileage and what it took for them to get there, you get into this place because it's like you you consume so much of it and you're like, why doesn't my work look like that? Well, it doesn't look like that because you're not them. At the end of the day, you're always not gonna be, you're always gonna just be yourself. You know, I had this friend recently tell me, she said, you know, I think at the end of the day, the thing that's the most important about people's work that stands out isn't the skill, it isn't the execution, it's it's the personality. It's who you are as a person. And I promise you, I think. I've seen recent success with it because I took in a hiatus from drawing because of this like existential issue. But I've seen success in this recently that like me embracing my current interests now, my current taste, like pursuing endeavors, you know, that aren't tied up in career. But personally, like the things that bring me joy, the bring, things that bring me that feeling of luxury helps me find a more definitive voice of what I want to see. Cause it's like, I feel like we, we, we get caught up in the appeal. Like what appeals to people? What appeals to companies? What will, make, what will people like? Even we don't hear that voice, it's it's very subconscious. That's our society, you know? But I think if you you get to this place, it's a beautiful feeling. I've only felt it a few times. And you realize you can literally do whatever the hell you want. That's all it is. People love authenticity and they love when it's communicated well. That's all it is. If you if you really get to that nitty gritty, and it'll take time, don't get me wrong. Like we're all, we're all very young, you know, you're gonna, like I said, that back and forth is gonna keep happening. You're never gonna find the style. You're just gonna be, com be comfortable sometimes and uncomfortable in others, you know, it's the, what, the difference is what you do when you are uncomfortable. When you realize that you are changing, growing, or even regressing, what does that mean? What are you gonna do with it? Are you gonna kick yourself in the ass or are you gonna be kind to yourself and recognize that you are growing as a person, you know? And I think that's very, I think that's a very important realization to have. And then I think if you can kind of get to that place in a consistent wavelength, you'll feel a lot more comfortable with your journey of finding your style, growing, changing. That makes sense. I hope that makes sense. I, I, I guess I could give a con concrete answer. Look up to artists. Don't compare yourself too much. Uh, be kind to yourself and embrace the fact that you want to do what you want. You know, communicate it well. That's it. You know, and be ready for those dips because you're going to find a lot of dips, but it's, you know, that's, that's the part of it. You know, that's the part of life, you know, sadly. Life is unfair, but, you know, we, luckily we're smart, so we can kind of make it a little more fun sometimes. You know, I think that one of the differences between graphic design and illustration is that there is that existential component that illustration possesses. Um, there, it's, it's hard to remove yourself emotionally from it, the practice. Um, and I think that why the style, one of the reasons the style question gets asked so much is basically what Justin said is that folks are going through a quarter life crisis when they're being encouraged to try to find a style. They're trying to find out who they are as people. So it's like, how, how are they going to know who they are? You know, if they are, well, who they are as a visual communicator, if they don't know who they are. Um, and you know, who told me that for the first time, Justin, the, the personality mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. it was uh, Richard Goodwin. Richard Goodwin was the first yeah, person. Yeah who said, your style is who you are. And if you don't know who you are, you don't have a style. Recognize y'all, everybody's time scales are different. You know, like you're gonna get there when you get there. That's the reality of it is. It's like anything that's gonna impact that is your anxiety that you're not there. Don't let the anxiety overwhelm you. You know, cause everybody's in very different places. You know, there, 
going to SCAD, you know, I had to work full time when I went to SCAD. So the amount of time I had allotted for drawing, for making time for me as a human was very constrained. You know, I had other friends, rich kids, you know, you know, all, all they had to do was draw and chill, you know, and that's fine. You know, that, that's different realities, but it's like, because of those different circumstances, it, our time skills are a little different. But if, if you're just kind to yourself and you recognize it'll happen as it happened. And I think, you know, like what you're saying about stress, the stress of like when I'm going to make it, you know, like you can turn that stress into excitement, you know, because it, it's like, you know, my buddy went to school for accounting and like as soon as he graduated, he bought a suit and like interviewed with a few companies and then he was placed in a position in a cubicle, you know, there was lots of certainty to those decisions, right? Like an, a safe route, you know. But I think that's what's exciting about the art route is that you don't have that certainty and it could, it's stressful sometimes, but you can also turn that stress into excitement in that how boring would it be if we all graduated and all we had to do is buy a suit and interview at a few places and then we're there. You know? That would suck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hate you know? Justin, thank you so much for, for lending us your time today. Super helpful demo, super great anecdotes on color so great to see you man like i wish you as always nothing but the best um stay in touch let me know what you're up to what you're doing if you need help on anything let me know y'all have a good day bye guys